that essentially wanted uh, a way to, to manage their terminology in the cloud. So that has been in production and uh, live since um, late 2018. Um, in addition to that, we also have something that's called Language Cloud Online Translation Editor, um, which um, is not too well known in terms of um, our enterprise customers, because this is an offering which is more focused towards what we call um, casual translators. Um, so this is basically non-professionals that um, that speak a second language uh, and and need to do uh, quick translations uh, on the side. So that's an offering that again, as part of the language cloud platform, has been li uh, live for I think at least two years now. Um, what this gives is basically a very uh, easy to use um, post editing interface where you basically you submit a document, we uh, pre-translate it using machine translation, and you get then an online browser-based environment where you can do quick post-editing. So this is aimed solely at, at casual translators. Uh, we have collaborations with, uh, if you know, platforms like ProZ. Um, as part of their subscription, this is, uh, this is offered. So, um, and the, the big launch that we had um, two weeks ago is essentially focused on what we call language cloud translation management. So again, this is a packaging of, of some capabilities in the language cloud platform. Uh, to enable um, certain use cases. So this is where we added significant new capabilities in terms of workflow, reporting, translation memory, etc., etc. Um, and the gray areas are um, some of the additional off offerings that we're looking at in the future. Um, so one key thing is then also um, scaling down the translation management towards more um, LSP use cases. Um, so we have a lot of customers that, for example, don't necessarily need sophisticated workflows. They need more collaboration, etc. Um, so we're also working towards um, uh, offering that. Um, and what that also enables is that basically, um, which we ha we didn't have in the, in the past, is we can allow customers to grow with us. So you can essentially start with a smaller language cloud, and then as you evolve and as you mature. Um, you can add on certain capabilities and you don't need to switch to another platform, install something separate. It's basically um, based on uh, benefits and feature toggles, etc. We can enable certain functionality to customers. Um, the other thing we're sorry, uh, the other thing we're looking at is, is language cloud for translators. Um, so this is essentially, if you think of being an individual translator, um, having an Office 365 like environment where just if you're working on your own, you can store your translation memories, your project in the cloud, but also enabling to uh, allow groups of freelancers, for example, to collaborate with each other in a much easier way, which today, because they work in a desktop application like Studio, it's very difficult um, for those users to do. So in essence, the key points of this is basically think of language cloud as a platform, which allows us to, to basically bundle capabilities into, into certain business offerings. Um, and package them up in, in various ways. Um, and so this is significantly different from how we have built products in the past, where basically it was a monolithic application, um, which we either hosted for you or you deployed on premise, and that's what you got. Um, and then the, the functionality was all there. Right? Um, so in terms of the architecture, um, so Essentially, we have the language cloud platform, which is this big green box. This holds all the um, microservices uh, orchestration around uh, the backend. Um, we then, the things in blue are basically um, applications that sit on top of that backend. So um, things like, for example, the, the uh, client portal application, the user interface, translation management application, even SDL Trado Studio, a desktop client, or the connectors, they essentially sit on top of the platform. And what that means is that from a, from a language cloud perspective, we have an API first approach. So we have REST APIs, um, and our own developers make use of those REST APIs. So um, essentially, everything you can do on the, uh, on the platform is exposed through APIs. Um, so everything that our um, our customers, um, uh, our own developers also use. Um, we then have some additional platforms that we're um, that we're integrating with. So we have the SDL machine translation uh, platform, which which Arnaud showed. 
We have a linguistic AI platform, which is the, the platform that gives us the API capabilities. Um, and we also have some third party um, um, platforms that we're making use of. So for example, Auth0 uh, in terms of um, uh, identity providers, so SSO federation, etc. Um, and SendGrid for, for sending email notifications out of the system. Um, in terms of API, and we'll go into more detail in, in the afternoon in the API session, what we are currently doing is we essentially we're building a, a public API layer on top of the, the internal APIs we have um, to essentially um, give you as, as integrators more stability um, so that you have a, a certain API with certain contracts and where we ensure backwards compatibility, etc. While at the same time allowing our own developers to uh, to develop faster and iterate without having uh, to worry too much about breaking the APIs for, for the customers. Um, so that's why we're not exposing our internal APIs, but we're building a, a public API layer on top of that. Um, on the right hand side, we have our own language services. So uh, SDL not only delivers technology, but also provides translation services. Um, so we're also integrating what we call the, the in SDL internal uh, delivery ecosystem into language cloud. So these are things like just finance management, invoicing, uh, etc. Um, yeah, so this is the high level um, architecture. Um, some key principles just in terms of, uh, of the platform um, being very transparent. So this is both public but also internal. So as mentioned, um, one of the key things I always say is that we I personally call this a true cloud platform because if we look at uh, some of the competitors, but even some of our own offerings, uh, cloud has been uh, has been misused by marketing a lot. So essentially, what used to be a hosted server suddenly is called cloud, even though it's no different than it was. Um, but this is really a true cloud platform where basically we have microservices. Um, which um, gives us a lot of, um, of benefits. Um, it's also multi-tenant, so um, there is no multiple instances of, uh, of language cloud. There is one instance, um, so every customer is on the same version. Everyone gets the same bug fixes. Um, we don't have uh, multiple instances, so it's like uh, a, a true cloud platform. Um, what this also gives us is scalability and elasticity. So. Um, we no longer have to spin up additional instances of anything, but we basically just um, add additional uh, microservices uh, into the platform. So because they are specific, we can basically say, I don't know, if we see a lot of load on, um, um, on translation memory operations, for example, uh, we can just um, spin up some additional translation memory nodes um, and, and support that load. Um, and um, then also resilience and fault tolerance. So um, for every microservice, we have at least uh, two. Um, many more um, depending on what kind of service and the load on the service. Uh, but this allows us to essentially um, yeah, um, have more resilience. So if one node goes down, it doesn't matter because the other one is, is serving content. Uh, but it also allows us in terms of updates so we can uh, we can update without downtime because we can just uh, upgrade in one node and then reroute the traffic and while we upgrade uh, the other node. Um, so a lot of flexibility there. Um, in terms of other principles, so when we looked at, at Language Cloud, we, we tried as much to leverage existing technology. Um, so what that means is we essentially a couple of years ago, we looked at all our technology stack that we had. And um, as you might know, we do have a lot of products. So we have four different translation memory technologies. We have uh, three tra terminology management technologies. We have three workflow engines, etc. We looked at the whole portfolio and the whole scape, uh, scope um, and made decisions based on, OK, how fit for purpose is this for a cloud world? Can we leverage that technology, um, which, for example, we did with translation memory? Um, it was modern enough that allowed us to basically microservice it. Um, versus other technologies like, for example, terminology management, um, which had a 15, 20 year old code base, which we felt was very difficult for us to, to bring into a cloud world. So essentially what we did there is we took the decision to develop that from scratch, essentially. Um, so we leverage existing technologies where we can. So we have a, a, a lot of maturity in certain parts of the platform. 
while for things that were not modern enough, we, we essentially um, rebuilt them. Um, we also standardized the technology stack. So as I mentioned, one of the key things was to look at all the portfolio that we have um, and decide on, OK, what's the best of breed of each of the products? What do some products do well? What are weaknesses? And try to consolidate that into, um, into the platform. We also um, try to leverage open source where we can. So for things where we know we are not experts and it's not our um, it's not our bread and butter, it's not where we are good at, we leverage open source as much as we can. So things like the workflow engine, for example, rather than develop our own proprietary workflow engine, we basically looked at, okay, what are um, standard workflow solutions that are in the market that we could take and allow us to fulfill our use cases. Um, so for, op for, for workflow, we use an engine called Kamunda, for example, that allows us to model the linguistic processes into the platform. Um, or for reporting, for example, we basically took uh, an not open source, but an enterprise BI engine that we basically plugged in because we're not the people that, that do reporting much better than we would ever hope to do, right? Um, and in terms of the infrastructure, it's provider agnostic. So what that means is we're not tied to something like AWS or Azure, et cetera, that allows us to not move out and move into different platforms. So we try to be, um, or we are provider agnostic, so we can deploy anywhere, um, which is also a key aspect for us because um, we do see that um, we do have customers where in the future we might have to take this platform on premise because we have customers that, for example, would never deploy in the cloud. So by not tying ourselves to AWS, etc., cetera, um, we, we hold that flexibility to be able to deploy the platform um, wherever necessary. Um, in terms of maybe more internal reasonings, but maybe helpful to know is um, one of the key things we did with Language Cloud is in, or one of the key challenges we had is basically scalable development. Um, so um, we have quite a large team working on Language Cloud now. Um, and obviously with a, with a monolithic application, it, it would be very difficult to have all these different teams not get in the way of each other. So um, through this microservices architecture, it also allows us to scale our development quite well. So basically, um, we um, each microservice has, a, has owner teams. Um, and essentially, they, they own the, the, the service. There are certain contracts between the teams, but everyone can evolve at their own pace uh, and make decisions that, that they need without getting in the way of each other. Um, so that's a, this has really helped us, um, especially in the last 12 months, to basically accelerate development because we had multiple work streams happening. Uh, and when one team did something, it didn't break someone else's team. It's very much a, a API first approach and where basically people work with um, mocked API first before the implementation is there. So if there are team dependencies, they can, uh, they're not blocked until the implementation is there, but basically they already know what the endpoints would return and what the contract is. Um, in terms of technologies, um, we essentially allow our developers to use either Java or .NET, um, depending on skills, but also what the best suited technology is for whatever use case they're solving. Um, we have a lot of automation, so the whole platform, we'll see it in a bit, is automated from uh, deployment. Um, so whenever someone does a, a check-in of code, it goes into a continuous uh, delivery pipeline. Um, and we also have um, lightweight governance between the teams. So what that means is that um, there is a blueprint in terms of every microservice, how it needs to look, certain standards it has, has to adhere to, such as um, what logging mechanism, what to log, where to log it to, metrics, etc. So the, the whole framework is available. So we have blueprints for both Java and .NET services. But within that framework, um, the teams can take decisions um, as much as they want. So that we, we don't constrain them. So they. Uh, they can be as, um, as fast uh, as necessary, while at the same time making sure that they adhere to the platform standards. Um, in terms of platform capabilities, so from a, um, from a, a, a business perspective, so um, without going into too much detail, so we have um, various business um, offerings. So this is basically the blue things are, are things like the customer portal, um, 
um, translation memory, etc. Um, and you can see that within those business capabilities, there might be one or more services that are, are powering this. Um, and then um, for a more technical view, it's not the greatest beam presentation, but um, this is basically we currently in the platform we have uh, 55 microservices um, um, that are focused on on certain things, right? So we have, for example, um, just file processing, for example. So converting a file from Word uh, into our bilingual format is being done by a microservice, um, while um, we have other things like, for example, translation memory matching. Um, for which we basically have a translation uh, memory service. So each of these are, are, are independent of each other. They essentially communicate with each other um, based on API calls. Um, and what this allows us to do is to basically evolve all of these services independently of each other. So um, what that means is if we, um, again, it's contrary to how we used to develop in the past, um, if there's a, a bug in a quoting area, for example, um, the team that's responsible for the pricing service, they will just code the fix um, and they can just independently update and release their pricing service to a new version without impacting any of the other services. So no longer do we have to package up a major release, a service pack, etc., just to fix one single bug, right? It's relatively independent. Um, which gives us a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of um, deploying bug fixes very quickly. Um, so just in, in terms of the anatomy of the platform, um, again, I'm not an architect, but I'll try to explain as much as possible. So essentially we have what we call the language cloud platform parameter, where we basically have an API gateway um, in the beginning that basically um, then routes all the calls that come from a client application. So this can be um, user interface in the browser or something like Studio um, or in future even third-party services. They go through a load balancer into the API gateway um, which then routes it to, uh, to the individual services. Um, we have a persistence layer, um, we have a messaging layer, we have certain infrastructure services that power the platform, so things like continuous delivery, uh, metrics, um, discovery, so is a service available, yes or no, central logging, monitoring. So this is basically what I meant in terms of the, the governance. So each of the services have to make sure that they speak in a standard way to these infrastructure services. Um, but within their own service, they're free to do pretty much what, what they need to, to fulfill the business requirements. Um, then we have a couple of supporting services. So these are things like identity management, account management, access management, entitlement, subscriptions, data retention, workflow, etc. Um, so uh, this is basically the, um, uh, the what's behind the, the, the platform. Um, in terms of API, just briefly because we'll cover it in the other session, every individual microservice um, exposes an API. Um, we, are, we have a basically a public API which abstracts away these uh, individual services because you as, a, as an integrator or a customer, you don't want to have to speak to each individual service and know which service does what. Um, so we're working on, on this abstraction layer. Um, in terms of technologies, it's, it's RESTful APIs and for authentication and communi communication, we use uh, OAuth um, tokens. Um, in terms of roadmap, so um, we'll cover this in the other session. So we're working on uh, content integration, um, which is basically in terms of um, integration is document management systems to allow you to get content in and uh, deliver content back. Um, but we're also working on what we call the Language Cloud Platform API, which is a, a, a new native Language Cloud API. Um, in terms of multi-tenancy, so as mentioned, um, we, there's only one platform, so all the infrastructure is, is shared. Um, but we do have various containers, so each um, account, or what we call tenant, which in the old world used to be a server instance, um, is now basically a tenant, so which is a logical container unit for, for customer data. Um, and there's a strict boundary between uh, the various tenants. Um, and because this is a multi-tenant platform, every customer benefits from the scale of the platform. 
Um, and basically, in terms of logical container units, we have account data, um, which is owned by SDL. So this is information around, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a company, I've purchased language cloud, what subscription does this account have, etc. Then there's the customer data, which is owned by the customer. This is where all the information around projects, files, term bases, TMs are held. Um, and this is, this is obviously segregated by, by customer. Um, and um, user data, which is basically owned by each individual user. What that means is that um, you can be a user, for example, that's part of multiple tenants. Because you might be, for example, a, a freelance translator that works for two different enterprises. Um, so you have your own unique identity. You don't exist multiple times in the platform. You basically exist just once. Um, and, and then you can essentially work for multiple tenants. Um, this is also important as we, as we look to the evolution of the language cloud platform, where basically um, we will be allowing um, better collaboration and integration between um, various users and uh, and um, and the platform. So things like also uh, being able to to look for jobs, to look for work, uh, to offer work out to the community, etc. Um, in terms of identity, so um, every user needs to have what we call an SDL ID, um, which is essentially our um, single sign-on um, uh, um, ID. Um, we use basically Auth0 as an identity provider, so we haven't developed uh, uh, this from scratch. So Auth0 is basically like an umbrella SSO provider, which allows you to, um, which allows you even to, if you use some other SSO provider like Okta or uh, Azure, etc., you can basically integrate with the Auth0 platform, and uh, this allows for federation of your um, SSO. Um, the authentication is based on OpenID Connect. You guys probably know better than me what that means. <laughs> um, and we also have support for things like uh, social login federation and multi-factor authentication. So this is everything that Auth0 just gives us out of the box by, by using it. Um, then briefly on, on access management. So within the application, we also have um, a concept of what we call folders. Um, so this, in some of our previous products, um, was often called organizations. What this basically is that within your tenant, it allows you to, to structure your content and, uh, and, and manage access to those resources. So it works pretty much like a folder file system. So that's why we called it folders. So you basically have a root. Um, you have certain um, predefined structures at this stage. So we don't allow you to create your own folders at this stage. But basically, you set up customers, which is basically uh, in the enterprise space is a business unit. So you would set up uh, R&D, marketing, etc. Uh, and within that, you can then place various resources, such as uh, translation memory projects, um, pricing models, etc. So this allows you to structure your content. Um, but also provide access um, to it. Also things like vendors, for example. So each vendor can be set up. They can have their own what we call vendor order template, which is essentially pricing models and the service that they offer. Um, and then in terms of access management, the uh, permissions, basically users are members of, of groups. And groups have roles in specific folders. Um, and then we basically um, um, inherit uh, permissions down the chain. So basically, if you look at this, Eric, he's a member of the project managers group that has a role in root, which means uh, Eric has access to all of the f these folders below as a project manager. Um, but then you can also be more granular. For example, uh, if you look at Luis, he's a member of the project requesters group in marketing, which means that this user can only request translation for uh, anything that's in the marketing folder. This user will not have any visibility into R&D or legal. Um, but this is, you can relatively flexibly decide who you want to give access to what. Um, and then in terms of um, pr performing work, so essentially what we also do is what we call implicit task access. So essentially you have to think about it if you, if you assign work to someone to, to do, um, rather than have to pre-configure things to make sure that this user has access to all the necessary relevant resources, 
um, the system does it for you. So essentially what this means is, as part of the task assignment, the system grants access to that individual user um, during the runtime of that task. So a user accepts a task, so we pr provide access to the translation memory, to the project, etc. Everything that's necessary to perform that task. And then when the task is completed, we revoke that access again automatically. So this ensures that you can make sure that, for example, if you work with external resources, they don't have access to content that they shouldn't have unless they're working for you, etc. Um, so that's an additional layer in terms of the permission management system. Um, in terms of customer portals, so um, for those that are familiar with, with us and our products, um, for the language uh, for the language called customer portal, we are essentially le leveraging an existing past uh, piece of technology, which is, was previously known as SDL Managed Translation, um, which provides a familiar user interface and includes all the connector integrations. So that's why we also have all the connectors integrated from day one. We didn't have to rebuild them from scratch. Um, and that basically is a, is, a, is a layer that currently connects to both language cloud, but also um, the TMS platform, which is a previous product um, that we have offered. So that's basically using the same customer portal, which allows us to, to leverage some of, of that. Um, in terms of API, that also means that from day one, we, we have all the APIs that, that are available in terms of content connectors from day one. Um, then in terms of workflow, so um, within the translation management platform, one of the key pieces is essentially workflow. So orchestrating things like um, sending things to uh, certain users, machine translation, quoting, costing, etc. That's all done through uh, a, a workflow engine. So this is an open source Kamunda engine, um, which gives us a lot of flexibility. It essentially allows you to model any business process in the world. Um, but we basically take this and, and adapt it to, um, to, to the linguistic process. What you see here at the bottom is essentially this is the, the user interface that Kamunda offers and that our developers currently use to build workflows. On the right hand side is how it looks in terms of what we exposed in the application. So obviously um, we, we couldn't easily expose all of this to individual customers because it needs a lot of knowledge. So we basically um, abstracted it into uh, the initial start of the, the workflow. Um, which basically comes with five out-of-the-box workflow templates, as we call them. Um, but within those workflows, we offer a certain amount of complexity um, and configurability. So um, the standard workflows, they, the most complex one, for example, that comes out of the box already with 14 human tasks. Um, so these are things like um, engineering, translation, linguistic review, customer review, uh, desktop publishing, etc. So um, quite a lot of industry uh, standard workflow. Um, and as I mentioned uh, this morning, you can, you can essentially customize within that. So you can, for example, skip certain tasks. Um, you can skip cer certain languages um, to basically further customize your workflow from, from what you have there. Um, what we don't allow right now, but this is very uh, soon on the roadmap, is basically workflow customization. So this is around um, so the key things we're focusing on is the ability to create your own human task. So take a task, name it whatever you want, and put it uh, in a sequence in the workflow. Um, and then also the ability to create your own custom tasks. Um, and what that means is basically um, you could think of a task, for example, where you want to do some pre-processing on a file. So you could develop your own custom task um, that goes off into a third-party system somewhere, performs some actions, and returns uh, the content back. Um, so those are things that are not available as of this launch, um, but that is very um, imminent in terms of the work uh, in the workflow roadmap that we're working on. Um, and then eventually, again, we'll have to see, but um, we'll also then look into things like branching workflows, looping workflows, dynamic workflows, which the backend system allows us to do. We just need to um, basically, in terms of milestones, see when and and how we expose those um, towards our customers. Um, yeah, so in terms of uh, language technology, as I mentioned, we, we looked at which technologies we can reuse and leverage. Um, so where it makes sense, we, we reuse some of the existing uh, technologies, so things like translation memory, file type support. So this is all our file processing filters from 
converting something from a word or an InDesign file into our bil bilingual content. That's reused, everything around segmentation, tokenization, perfect matching. So this is all um, mature existing technology that we have um, and that we're reusing in this platform. It's also 100% Trado Studio compatible. Um, so there are no more challenges that we used to have in terms of dif differing word counts, different quoting, etc., because it's all the same technology. Um, quite interesting in terms of bilingual content models. So for those that are familiar, we, we have a file-based format which is called SDLXLIF. Um, what we also introduce now is basically a database representation of that which we're calling bilingual content model. So in language cloud, whenever a file turns into its bilingual format, it's no longer a file, it's basically a database format, um, which is an in-memory memory modeled uh, based on a JSON format. Um, and it's a, it's a superset of the SDLXLIF format, but uh, backwards compatible. And what this allows us to do, we'll see it in the next slide, is basically for things like the online editor, we're no longer working on a, on a file, but on a database which allows us to offer things like concurrent editing, etc. So a lot more um, functionality. In terms of terminology, as I mentioned, we, um, we didn't reuse the existing technology, but basically what we did is we re rebuilt a new uh, terminology management solution from scratch, um, but based on multi-term concepts. So multi-term is our, our market leading tr uh, terminology management solution. Um, which has a lot of strong points in terms of flexible database creation, etc. Um, but at the same time, had certain limitations that we wanted to get to. So, for example, one of the things you were never able to do is make wholesale um, changes to the database structure in Maltem. When you wanted to add a new field or delete a field, you essentially had to recreate a new database. With this new implementation, we we now basically allow you to make wholesome changes to the database structure. Um, and that replicates across the database. So you can rename fields, you can delete fields, you can delete languages, and it replicates along uh, the terminology structure, which is quite um, significant in terms of what customers want. A lot of other benefits, um, I could talk an hour about it. Um, then m another uh, interesting um, piece of technology is the online editor. So this is something that we started developing around four or five years ago. Um, it's basically a very modern browser-based uh, translation editor. It's written in JavaScript um, and it has a back-end editor service which is basically this uh, bilingual uh, in-memory object model. Um, and it then makes use of web sockets which allows for real-time collaboration. So for example, what we can do is um, we can lock um, content on a segment level, so a sentence level which allows us to have multiple users work concurrently on the same document. So basically, if you look here, you have two users, a translator and a reviewer, that are working on their online editor. And using WebSockets, the backend basically keeps up to date. Um, and what this allows us to do is essentially, because it's working on a database structure, is user A and user B can work on the same document, because we basically no longer lock at the file level, but we lock at the sentence level. So you, you'll see if you know things like, uh, Google Docs or have you worked Word Online, you can see, okay, this, this segment is locked because user A is working on it uh, and user B is working on another segment. Um, so this is something that's, that's quite promising and will help us with, with more collaborative working in the, in the future. Um, in terms of the overall cloud stack, so um, we basically, um, for the whole uh, platform, so things like service discovery, metrics, etc. Again, it's not something we developed ourselves, but we basically leverage what's, what's out there in the market. So we use a lot of Netflix technologies that have been made open source to, to run their platform. So things like service discovery, load balancing, API gateways are all based on, uh, on Netflix um, and Spring Cloud um, technologies. Um, our Java services are deployed as Linux containers uh, and managed by Kubernetes. Um, the .NET services are currently deployed in Windows VMs, but we are currently working on uh, containerizing those. Um, so that will be imminent. So moving all the technologies into um, uh, .NET uh, technologies into Windows containers. Um, and whenever we build new .NET services, right now we, we are doing that based on .NET Core um, and planning to run those in, in Linux containers rather than more traditional um, uh, .NET technologies. Uh, 
Um, then briefly on continuous delivery, so um, it's quite important. So essentially the whole uh, delivery pipeline is automated. So what that means is you have this developer here. Um, whenever he pushes a commit, it goes into a Git repository, um, which then automatically in Jenkins, again, you guys probably know better than me what this is. Uh, Jenkins, it basically creates a build. There's component tests that run. Um, it then gets deployed into um, a continuous integration environment. So we have basically in language cloud, we have, I think it's five different environments. So we have continuous integration, we have QA, we have um, UAT, staging and production. Um, so any piece of code will, will go through these uh, different platforms. So when a, when a commit is done, it goes into the continuous integration. The component test runs. If those are passed, it then gets pushed into the QA environment. This is where the, the, the QA team then runs all the, the tests. Once that's passed, it moves into UAT. Um, UAT is essentially an environment where um, currently over 100 SDL employees have access to, and they basically get access to the features before they're deployed. They can give us feedback while they're still in development. Um, it then goes into staging, and once it's passed staging, it, it goes into production. And at certain points in here, you have some human decision gates. Obviously, when things are moving from, from um, CI into QA, um, we're more flexible. But once it, it moves from UAT into staging and production, we have certain decision gates and, and automated tests that need to run before they can be deployed in, in production. Um, and we basically have a, um, like a, a daily committee that basically sits there and, and looks at all the changes that were proposed and makes decisions on can they be deployed in production, yes or no. Um, the other thing to consider here is also that um, we, we can be quite flexible in terms of just because things are in production doesn't necessarily mean that our customers will see it. Um, so because we essentially have things like uh, feature flags which allow us to deploy code in production but hide it from the customer. So it's there but it's not enabled yet so you don't see it in the UI. Um, and this basically allows us to, to always keep moving forward. So we will deploy things into production, even if they're not uh, necessarily finished yet in terms of new functionality. Um, but we can then basically ev evolve it, or we can basically say um, we can give you access to look at the new functionality uh, in a specific tenant. So these are things like staging tenants, for example. So if you um, if, if you as a customer want to have more control in terms of, okay, there's a significant new feature, I don't want it to just be turned on for my customers without me having the ability to validate it. Um, we can basically set up something like a staging tenant where basically new features are activated, you can test them, and then once you as an organization are happy with it, you can activate it in your production tenant, exposing it to all of your users. Um, yeah, so this gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, in terms of hosting, so um, we're currently hosted in, in NTT in San Jose. Um, we are planning in the very short term to move to Frankfurt, Germany initially because we have a lot of customers that don't want their data to, to leave the European Union. Um, but longer term, what we're looking at is basically a multi-region deployment um, where if you remember that one slide around the data segregation where we want to enable customers to say, I want to decide where my customer data resides and to not have it leave that location. Um, so that's something that we're working on where basically we will see we'll very likely have uh, US uh, deployments, European deployments, Asian deployments um, of basically the same language cloud, um, but where certain data can, can reside in, in, in certain locations. 